In the aftermath of the Great War, it's difficult to separate fact from fiction, history from myth, truth from legend. What is never in doubt is that in the autumn of 2281, a courier accepted a parcel that would change the course of their lives and the entire Mojave forever. This account is just one of the many that follow the courier through their journey. This is Legends of the Mojave. He couldn't believe he was doing this. He was furious at himself, at his own damned curiosity and wanderlust. Courier 6 was standing on Highway 95. The town of Novak, that he was now quite disdainful of, wasn't even completely behind him, and he was already halted in his tracks by a hulking tower in the distance. It wasn't even like this was the first time he had laid eyes on it. While trying to help the ghouls and repcons seek division, or whatever the hell all these post-war religious groups were into these days, the courier had visited the Gibson Scrapyard just north of Novak off an old frontage road. The tower was even more visible from there than it was from here on the highway. It wasn't important, there was absolutely no reason for him to deviate. He had his mission, find Benny, and depending on how charitable he felt when they met, maybe even let him plead his case before paying him back with a bullet of his own. There was even a strong likelihood that he might even have a fresh clue waiting for him in Boulder City. The tower was an unnecessary diversion. It was almost like his subconscious was fighting to make sure he never found Benny. Even his conscious mind seemed to have its own reservations. Before he left Good Springs, his every action taken had seemed to contribute to a greater good. There were good folk who were friendly, caring, and kind, and he repaid them for their generosity as best he could before embarking on his path. Since that fateful day, he had enabled the subjugation of an entire town, gambled his way into a small fortune with money taken from corpses, killed so many people he had lost count. He had witnessed atrocities so regularly that the very sight of a battered human body lying in a pool of blood no longer made his insides churn. This lonesome road was slowly robbing him of his humanity, and the closer he came to the man in the checkered jacket, the more apparent it was becoming that the seething hatred that once lurked in the shadows cast by a quest for justice had now grown until it now completely eclipsed all else. The courier told himself that he was going to bring Benny to justice, but even he didn't believe that anymore. And so there he stood, on the faded blacktop in the early morning sun, desperate to shed the mental burden of his mission, eager to push the implications as far from his mind as humanly possible. So he turned towards the tower once more. Whatever it was, it wasn't that far off his trail. So he'd make a quick detour. He'd long since given up hope of catching Benny before he reached the strip anyway. Might as well leave no stone left unturned. So he left the road and skirted past the scrapyard. Old Lady Gibson waved from her porch as she tended to her guard dogs. The courier returned the wave without breaking his stride and continued cross country toward the tower. This had better be worth it. The courier tried to stay vigilant. His inner turmoil had seemed to settle by the time his feet touched sand. He had made a decision and he was going to stick with it. But sand means desert, and desert means lots of nasty critters that want you dead. So he focused, kept his head on a swivel, and kept marching toward the tower, slowly rising higher and higher into the sky in stride. He arrived on a hilltop overlooking the tower, and was relieved by what he saw. A small NCR garrison manning a sandbag bunker by the entrance. It seemed dangerously exposed and undermanned this close to Legion territory, but at least he didn't have to worry about a surprise lottery in the near future. Turning his attention back to the tower, he could now see that it bore the name Helios I, no doubt named for some ancient mythical paradise or fearsome creature or god from back before nuclear hellfire had stripped such ideas from the common vocabulary. The sprawling field of mirrors that surrounded the tower in a fenced-in compound hinted at this facility's entire reason for being. It was a solar collection tower. If it was the ruin it appeared to be from the outside, it could be ignored just as easily as if it were an old Brahmin bone jutting out of the desert sands. But the NCR troopers patrolling the perimeter suggested that there was a chance this electricity plant was still active, and where there's power, there's someone willing to kill in order to seize it for themselves. As he approached the sandbag bunker, he was addressed by Lieutenant Haggerty. She wasn't especially friendly, but the courier appreciated her honesty and forthright 
right manner. It was a little concerning how easily their trust could be gained. Sure, he had been making a name for himself throughout the NCR, cleaning up the Long 15, arranging a permanent garrison for Prim, relaying news of the Nipton massacre to Mojave Outpost, even just little things like letting Ranger Andy know the condition of Ranger Station Charlie. Apparently, news of his exploits had been spreading, enough so that a Ranger had recently tracked him down for the purpose of giving him a two-way radio for emergency use, so maybe Haggerty had already heard heard of him. Regardless, it took almost no effort to get her to spill the beans on this place, and so close to the Legion, loose lips could be an issue. Haggerty was rather unsatisfied with her troops posting. There were too few of them to hold this station if the Legion decided to take it, and was even convinced that the only reason they were even still alive was simply because the Legion just really didn't want it. At the moment, it did not appear that Helios 1 was operational, but some idiot in sunglasses had been working for months to get the station back up and running again. If the facility could start generating power again, it would make Helios 1 strategically important enough to commit a real garrison to defend it, rather than Haggerty's token force which had been left behind after the rest of her unit was sent to defend Hoover Dam. Apparently, the NCR had committed a heavy military force to taking Helios 1, which when they found it was being held by the Brotherhood of Steel. The NCR apparently outnumbered the BOS over 20 to 1, but the Brotherhood made the NCR pay for every inch of the facility. Most of the station's defenders had been killed before they were forced to retreat, who then activated security systems and placed mines and other traps behind to ensure the NCR couldn't just sweep in and get the place running again. The NCR, demonstrating in grand fashion the sunk cost fallacy, wasn't about to just abandon a station that they had just paid for so dearly, even if it wasn't even operational. As the courier took his leave of the prickly LT and headed for the front door to the building, he once again couldn't quite figure out if the NCR was truly as incompetent as they appeared or was just a victim of circumstance. Committing a vast army to take a facility without even knowing that it was inoperable? Or perhaps they did know and simply didn't want to risk another faction getting it running for themselves. The Courier wasn't too familiar with the Brotherhood of Steel, but he knew they were a sort of religious sect that hoarded advanced technology and were pretty loath to see others in possession of it, meaning the NCR troopers were most likely at a massive technological disadvantage. Once they had the facility, probably brimming with hostile robots and automated turrets and landmines and all manner of death traps, the NCR could have just scuttled the station and removed the need for yet another tactically disadvantageous post that forced them to spread their overextended army even thinner. As he worked his way to the back of the facility looking for the purportedly less than intelligent fellow wearing sunglasses in a building that was already wanting for bright lights, he had a look around. Pouring through some terminals that were still running, the courier discovered that perhaps the NCR and the Brotherhood of Steel before them may have had good reason to try and keep Helios 1 out of the hands of others. Apparently there was some sort of system called Archimedes being tested at this facility, something dangerous enough that employees had to sign death and dismembership waivers. The courier wasn't quite sure what that meant, but it sounded nasty. By the sound of things, Archimedes worked with a few technical kinks to work out. Immediately after the initial test of Archimedes, a Brigadier General from the US Army had been stationed at Helios 1 indefinitely and would be the only one to authorize its use in any capacity other than a test. Military control over a power station? There could only be one sort of device that could warrant that level of interference from the government. Archimedes was a weapon, and the NCR was trying to get their hands on it. As he continued moving through the station, the courier had mixed feelings about this development. Whatever Archimedes was, it could possibly tip the balance of power back away from the Legion and make things safer for the people here in the Mojave. But were the NCR really the best people to be in possession of such a weapon? Would they use it to continue expanding? To force even more people to live in the shadow of the two-headed bear? To pay taxes to a government that seemed to give increasingly little back? but not for lack of trying by those at the lower levels. Would they become even more aggressive, massacring anyone who chose to oppose them? Would they become just as bad as Caesar's legion, only now a legion with a super weapon that none could hope to escape? The courier had to be careful and to be mindful of what could certainly be far-reaching consequences. In the back of the main building, he found a control room that proved to be home to a fair number of consoles, terminals, gadgets, widgets, and otherwise blinky stuff that could only mean he was close to finding his quarry. He found a man in a lab coat named Ignacio Rivas, 
apparently he was here not at the request of the NCR, but instead was from the followers of the Apocalypse, a woefully idealistic group who sought to feed, clothe, heal, and educate the people of the wastes and foster peaceful resolution to conflicts. Certainly a beautiful mission, but sorely out of place just about anywhere the Courier could remember seeing. After a short conversation, Revis simply warned the Courier that there were dangers here that no one in the NCR yet realized, and that he should take care to be mindful of his actions and of the requests that would surely dictate those actions. Didn't he literally just finish telling himself that? At least Revis seemed to be there with pure intentions. He did make a request to the Courier. If the Courier did find a way to restore power, he asked that it be distributed across the Mojave, not sent straight to the Strip, and not back to the NCR to make life better solely for their citizens, as was likely their intention in taking Helios 1. He also begged the Courier to destroy the weapon if he could. The Courier wasn't sure what he would do if given the choice. Revis was a man who seemed to have devoted his life to peace and improving the lives around him. A lovely sentiment, but hugging a gecko only results in a gushing neck wound. There's a time and a place for peaceful resolution, other times you just want a big stick with nails driven through it. It was time to talk to the sunglassed simpleton, and who boy did he live up to his reputation. Going by the name Fantastic, yeah, either his parents weren't the brightest glowing ones in the ghoul gaggle, or he was using a pseudonym. A, a bad one. Either way, it was all the courier could do to keep from laughing. Fantastic was suffering from the worst case of delusions of grandeur he had ever seen. To hear Fantastic tell it, he was the sole reason that Helios 1 was operational, cranking out a whopping 1% of the facility's operational output, and was rather insulted that someone in the NCR wasn't happy with that level of efficiency. He posted up at the largest console since that was obviously the most important, even though Revis told him that it was just the controls to the facility's intercom. Fantastic did have one useful skill at least. He was good at turning a phrase to suit his machinations. Oof, that word gives Fantastic way too much credit. It appears he landed this job when representatives from the NCR started going door to door looking for local scientists who could assess the facility's condition and if possible get it working to a useful capacity. When they knocked on Fantastic's door, he was asked if he knew anything about power plants and he replied as much as anyone he had ever met. When they asked if he knew anything about theoretical physics, he said he had a theoretical degree in physics. Apparently his smartest replies were veiled in just enough sarcasm that the poor NCR conscript tasked with looking for eggheads took his replies on good faith and set him up with near absolute control over what in fact proved to be an extremely important resource. Now the courier had to intervene. There was no way something as important as this place could be left to the idle button mashes of an ignoramus with a god complex. This place was extremely intricate, and the courier wasn't exactly an electrical engineer, or an expert on what he could only hope wasn't a weapon of mass destruction. So he would have to tread carefully, but much like Fantastic, he knew as much about power plants as anyone he had ever met, and few of them had the combat experience that could get them past whatever the Brotherhood left behind. So as usual, it would all have to fall on him to ensure tragedy was averted. So he entered the solar collection fields, row upon row of large focusing mirrors radiating outward from the tower like ripples over the Colorado. Here and there were tents pitched in the gaps between mirrors and even some old beds stretched out in the open. In two fenced-in alcoves, a pair of small radio towers, control hubs for the east and west mirror groups that needed reactivation and connection back to the Helios mainframe. The first he tried to access was deceptively simple. He could see almost immediately the reason why no one in the NCR was willing to approach the controls bear traps. The first he disarmed with almost no effort. One thing about working with and around the powder gangers, he had become well practiced in handling ground-based traps. While disabling a second bear trap, he nearly set off a tripwire rigged to an old shotgun, a nothing weapon to a BOS paladin getting ready to fall back from his position, a 20-gauge ticket to the afterlife for just about anyone else. Hoping to skirt around and disable from a safe position, the courier tried entering the shed from a gap in the sheet metal. The courier heard the chirping and thanks to his time with the powder gangers and the booby traps left by the legion in places like Nipton and Ranger Station Charlie, he instantly knew that he had messed up. He got out as quickly as he could, but he was still seriously wounded as two well-placed landmines exploded, sending shrapnel in all directions, whether there was a courier in their path or not. A painful expenditure of a doctor's bag followed by a stim pack and the courier was well on his way to recovery. While he rested for a bit to let the medicine mend his broken body, he couldn't help but be impressed. 
The Legion at this point had grown pretty predictable in their propensity to leave traps behind, and the Powder Gangers didn't really bother in setting up their improvised landmines in inconspicuous locations. Your average wasteland nut job rarely bothered with or had the resources to set up backup traps or additional triggers, but this was the first time the courier was lured into a trap by another poorly concealed one. These Brotherhood bastards knew how to deal in death, that much was sure. After he'd healed up a bit, the courier refocused the array using a password he'd scrounged from the main building. Apparently, Fantastic couldn't have even been bothered to explore the building for clues sitting right out on the open on desktops. Thankfully, the holotape hadn't been caught by any shrapnel. On the other end of the complex, the eastern controls were surrounded by sandbag bunkers. At least if he tripped another mine, he could just shimmy over the bags to safety on the other side assuming there wasn't a mine waiting for him there as well. But as soon as he picked the lock to the gates, he was swarmed by vicious attack dogs. Who the hell was responsible for this? There was no way these dogs would have still been alive if they had been left behind by the Brotherhood. And nobody in the NCR should have had access to this pen or had reason to try and keep anyone from the terminal. So who locked these dogs in and how were they being kept alive? At any rate, a 9mm made quick work of the cantankerous canines, and once he reached the terminal, everything was smooth sailing. Although this time around, he did have to get creative in order to gain access, since this terminal didn't have a password laying around that the courier could find. It was finally time to enter the tower. The bowels of the facility were dark and deadly. This place, as you would hope would be the case with all super weapon test sites, was state of the art. Automated defenses and military grade robots were everywhere. By the time he reached the mainframe level, he wasn't taking any chances. He spotted a single Mr. Gutsy charging in its pod and fired, knocking the robot out easily. Making his way to the mainframe, it appeared that there was not enough power being fed to the computer to allow user input. There was a small generator hooked to the mainframe, but it was heavily damaged. When he went up to the upper deck of this level to see if there was any way to feed more power to the mainframe, he discovered the Mr. Gutsy wasn't a Mr. Gutsy at all. In a cruel twist of hideous irony, it was a specially built Mr. Handy unit named Python, designed specifically to maintain the mechanical components in this area. Well, that was unfortunate. Anyone else might have just given up. That was it. Can't make this place run without the mainframe. Can't activate the weapon either. That moron down in the control center wouldn't be able to get this place running, and if they chose to come take it, the Legion... Well, did they even have scientists? But this wasn't just anyone else. This was the guy that had just helped launch a dozen ghouls into space with glowy juice from toy rockets and a doodad packed with dog hair from old lady Gibson's pooches. The courier simply harvested Python for anything that looked like it was still serviceable, packed it downstairs to the generator, and set to work. Good thing Poseidon Energy and General Atomics weren't around any longer. The courier could only imagine the shenanigans those pre-war businessmen would have gotten into if it was discovered that this place was being powered by GA. His grin tightened into a determined scowl as he cranked the generator up and listened to that baby purr. He logged into the mainframe and set to work to see what information he could access without causing another doomsday event. It seemed Archimedes was some sort of satellite weapon system. The tower converted solar energy into microwaves and sent them up into space where a satellite could bounce it back to Earth. A literal orbital death ray, just like in those Unstoppables comics. It looked like the weapon needed some sort of portable rangefinder to select a target, so that was good at least. Even if someone got the weapon up and running, they couldn't fire the thing unless they had that unit. Hopefully it wasn't laying in a trash heap or being used by some kid as a toy pistol or something. Now armed with the knowledge of exactly what Archimedes was, the courier navigated over to the power grid configuration. He could send power to Camp McCarran and the Las Vegas Strip. He could divert it to the outskirts of Vegas, or he could do as Ignatio asks and send power to the entire Mojave grid. This option came in two flavors, a standard output level, which would likely struggle to keep up with more than even minor demand from any one area, especially if Hoover Dam stopped producing power for any reason. Or he could set the station to overload, permanently destroying the facility's ability to carry power anywhere, but also destroying Archimedes once and for all or he could activate Archimedes and keep this massive power to himself. He took an access door to the outside of the tower. It was dark out. He had some hours before the sun came up and forced a decision. He stared out over the desert as he considered the consequences of his actions. This station was power. Power to subjugate, to control, but also to empower those who desperately needed it. 
If given extra energy reserves, places like Good Springs could build a pumping station to bring water from the springs all the way into town. No more risking getting mauled by geckos when you get thirsty or have to do laundry. Prim could renovate the Bison Steve, turning it into a real market for travelers on the Long 15, or possibly a government center, even if it would now be representing NCR interests. Novak could install spotlights, allowing their snipers the ability to actually see when Legion slavers come a-calling at night. But on the other hand, it could also be used by the mysterious Mr. House, the unseen man who controlled Vegas from the shadows, by Caesar to ensure his legions had warmth on the cold nights, cool in the hottest days. His armies would stay healthy while the NCR slowly succumbed to the desert. Or the NCR could do the same in turn. All would love nothing more than to have an ace up their sleeve like Archimedes, a super weapon guaranteed to annihilate anyone who would challenge them. As he stared off at the great glow that was New Vegas against the clear night sky, it was obvious they had all the power they needed. The NCR and the Legion could bleed each other white for all he cared. He owed no allegiance to either of them. At least he didn't remember swearing any oaths. And he knew a lot of people that could make good use of electricity, even if it was inconsistent and only meted out a trickle at a time. Archimedes was a threat, but without the handheld rangefinder unit, the weapon was useless anyway. So just as the sun was beginning to rise, the courier stepped back inside, strode to the mainframe, and set it to provide power to the entire region. The only thing left was to turn the system on. After grabbing a few winks in an office chair that was still kind of comfortable, he awoke and stepped back out into the high noon sunlight. Perfect time to start generating power. He proceeded up the catwalk, stepped up to the controls, and flipped the light switch on for every home in the Mojave. It seemed at least in the short term that everyone was happy. Ignatio was happy that the courier thought of the little people first. Fantastic was happy that he could now report higher than a 1% output to whoever his boss was. Lieutenant Haggerty... Okay, she wasn't all that happy. All the courier had done was made her post a much more attractive target for the Legion. But at least now there was a chance she could convince her superiors to provide a larger garrison to hold Helios 1, now that it had become strategically important. The only reward the courier received, besides some medical equipment and a science textbook from Ignatio Rivas, was the knowledge that if nothing else, he had finally done something good. Lasting, measurable good, that didn't simply come from killing bad actors or from carrying messages across the the sands. For now, it was enough. A tiny shred of his humanity restored. He returned to Highway 95, turned once again northward, and walked. And walked. And when he grew tired, he walked some more. He walked until he came upon some sort of encampment on an old overpass, so he decided to check it out. This was the 188 trade post, the place where the 95 and 93 met. There wasn't much, a father-daughter run canteen of sorts, a weapons dealer working for the gunrunners, but it also had Veronica. Veronica was one of the least assuming people you could ever hope to meet out on the road. She dressed in rags and she possessed the most endearingly sarcastic sense of humor you could ever hope to encounter. She was easy to underestimate, but that would be a fatal mistake because she was bred for battle, almost literally. You see, she was a member of the Brotherhood of Steel. Not some arrogant, power armor wearing, gatling laser toting stereotype, but one who specialized in finding good trade deals to get her family whatever they needed to survive. After a short conversation, she asked if she could accompany the courier, citing the fact that he looked like he could handle himself and that as a courier, he was likely to cross paths with many traders in his travels. So for the time being, their goals were aligned. It seemed like a win win. The courier had just nearly been blown in half by a BOS mine who better than a BOS, you know, she never did mention her rank and order, whatever it wasn't important. The point was that next time he found himself bleeding out in the sand, it might be nice to have someone with some basic combat first aid training tagging along. So the courier agreed, and the two set off for Boulder City. They wouldn't have far to travel. Boulder City should have been named Rubble Graveyard. The only two points of interest were the NCR Memorial commemorating the soldiers lost in the first Battle of Hoover Dam, which of course they won, and the crumbling remains of the town that the NCR was forced to blow into the next apocalypse in order to stop Caesar's legion troops from completely routing their lines during the battle. After grilling the town's bartender, figuratively not literally, and possibly only remaining resident, revealed no information regarding Benny's whereabouts, the courier said, off towards the rubble. There was apparently only one way in and one way out of the ruins, and wouldn't you know it, another NCR officer was blocking his path. 
Lieutenant Monroe tried to keep him out as there was currently a standoff with some great cons. Holy Adam's irradiated bosom they were still there and held firmly in place at NCR gunpoint and it wasn't even his birthday. The courier convinced Monroe to let him negotiate with the cons who were holding NCR hostages. Now that he had Veronica watching his back, he was feeling a little more willing to take an additional risk or two. The LT agreed since nobody in Monroe's unit had any negotiation training and his men were as good as dead under current circumstances anyway. What did he care if some wastelander got caught in the crossfire if things went south? The courier made his way past the line of NCR troopers and into what was left of an old storefront that the cons were using as their stronghold. The instant he stepped inside, he came face to face with someone with which he was already very much acquainted. Jessup, the man leading this group of cons, was none other than the man that had dug his premature grave. It was pretty clear the man was terrified. After all, he was staring down a ghost. A ghost who looked a whole lot more dangerous now with his weapons, armor, and bodyguard instead of a grungy old set of overalls. The courier wanted to burn a hole between Jessup's eyes, but he needed answers. Benny had apparently double-crossed the cons. What a surprise. Left them hanging with no platinum chip, no payment, and made for Vegas alone. That was it. These men had nothing that he wanted and the man that shot him was long gone, holed up inside the strip where only the rich and foolish could have access. He wanted to leave, just turn around and get on the road as soon as possible, but he had given his word to Monroe and started negotiating with Jessup. As much as he wanted to kill everyone who had had a hand in planting him in the dirt, these men were just pawns, hired muscle, and likely didn't have a lot more honorable options for paying work when they were hired. Here, there were other lives at stake, so he promised amnesty to the cons if they released the hostage and surrendered. It took some convincing, but it turns out Jessup was surprisingly reasonable when he was sober. Nothing at all like the night they first met. Things got a bit heated when he relayed the news to Lieutenant Monroe, however. Seems his superiors had ordered him to wipe out the cons. Yet again, the courier was forced to hold these people's lives in his hands and make the reasonable decision to spare them. He really didn't want that to be the case but he had made a promise to these men that they would be returned home safely if they surrendered. If news got out that he was making these promises just so the execution squads could have an easier go of things, the situation could get real complicated for him real quickly. He had a reputation to protect, today more than ever. Monroe backed down, agreed to uphold the deal negotiated by the courier regardless of his orders, and let peace win the day. The courier was exhausted and there was nothing left of any interest in this heap of gravel, so he and Veronica returned to the 188 trading post. He blew most of his purse on a battle rifle, one of the finest weapons he had held in a very long time, and offloaded most of the junk he had been lugging ever since Repcon. He was going to stay the night and rest up a bit before making the last mile on the road to New Vegas. He glanced off into the distance at the great glowing orb of light by now occupying most of his field of vision. Before settling in for the night, he sent a message across the universe in his mind. Soon, Benny, he thought to himself. I'll be seeing you real soon. So he laid down, with Veronica taking the first night watch. He closed his eyes, and for what seemed like the first time in weeks, he slept.